Hi, I'm Christian Gröbling. In this video I would like to explain you the principles of trigger point drain needling. But before I do so, I would like to give you a very brief overview of how the story of dry needling began. The use of dry needling started after a study in 1979 by a Czech physician, Karel Levitt, where it was emphasized that the needle effect is distinct from that of the injected substance. Since then, numerous studies have supported Levitt's findings and found no difference between injections of different substances and dry needling in the treatment of myofascial pain. Therefore, it is important to recognize that the origins of dry needling are drawn from Western medicine principles. Although the same needles are used in dry needling and in acupuncture, dry needling has no historical ties to acupuncture. In the early 1980s, two main conceptual models of deep dry needling developed the trigger point model and the radiculopathy model. The trigger point model is based on the findings of the medical doctors Janet Travell and David G. Simons. They proposed that a myofascial trigger point is defined as a hypersensitive spot in a skeletal muscle within a taut band and that trigger points are the hallmark of the myofascial pain and dysfunction syndrome. Based on the knowledge about the pathophysiology of myofascial trigger points, the goals of trigger point dry needling are to increase the local energy supply within the trigger point by increasing the blood circulation, to decrease the local concentration of sensitizing substances and to mobilize the taut band and the connective tissue around the taut band. In addition, dry needling can be considered as a form of microsurgery to get rid of contraction knots. There were several clinicians and researchers in the 1980s and in the early 1990s who contributed findings to the trigger point model of dry needling. The radiculopathy model was proposed by the Canadian physician John Gunn in the 1980s. To distinguish this approach from other methods of dry needling, John Gunn named it intramuscular stimulation IMS. The gun IMS technique is based on the premise that musculoskeletal pain is a result of peripheral neuropathy or radiculopathy. In the early 1990s, the physical therapist Ricky Weissman, the physician Fernando Cola and myself established a systematic trigger point dry needling approach. Our approach of dry needling is based on the myofascial trigger point concept of Simons and Travell and on our experience with the so-called Swiss approach. The Swiss approach is a form of manual trigger point therapy which was introduced by the Swiss physician Beat Deum and a group of physiotherapists in the early 1980s. Since the early 1990s where we introduced our trigger point training approach we constantly improved the techniques with respect to safety and effectiveness. The techniques that we teach you in this video training and in our courses are the result of more than 25 years of experience. Trigger point needling is basically done in two different intensities. Static needling, which is less intensive and used for so-called strong responders, and dynamic needling, which is more intensive and used for weak responders. Let's have a look at the techniques of trigger point needling. Once you have palpated the taut band and the trigger point here in the upper trapezius, disinfect the skin. To find the trigger point with the needle, use the so called coning or sewing machine technique, which I explain you in another video. One possible way to differentiate if the patient is a strong or weak responder is the following procedure. Immediately after the first local twitch response, let the needle sit there for a few seconds. If the patient feels a strong crampy pain in these first seconds after the twitch, then the patient is a strong responder and you use static dry needling. Static dry needling means to let the needle in the trigger point until the cramp decreases. 
that may take about 15 seconds up to several minutes. As soon as the cramp decreases, needle the adjoining zone of the taut band that you have palpated with your fingers first in a fan-shaped manner. If there is another local twitch response, repeat the procedure. Please note that when you use static needling with a pincer grip, then you have to hold the pincer grip. Letting the grip go could result in a slight dislocation of the needle tip. This could be a safety issue or just result in a less effective treatment because the needle is maybe no longer precise in the trigger point. Now let's have a look at the dynamic needling. If the patient feels no strong crampy pain in the first seconds after the twitch, then the patient is a weak responder and you can use dynamic needling. The difference to static needling is that it is much faster. As there is no crampy pain after the twitch response, you don't have to wait. You can needle the adjoining zone of the taut band that you have palpated with your fingers first repeatedly until the local twitch response decreases. As in static needling, the needling along the taut band is done in a fan-shaped manner. Static needling is less intensive than dynamic needling. It is used for patients who respond strong to needling for so-called strong responders. Dynamic needling can be used for weak responders. The above described procedure is one way to differentiate strong from weak responders. The essential point is to adjust the intensity of the treatment to your patient and therefore not to undertreat or overtreat the patient. In clinical practice, you will probably often use something in between static and dynamic needling. The usual frequency of treatments with trigger point needling on one muscle is about one to two treatments per week. The interval between two treatments should be at least 48 hours. When using trigger point needling, it is also important to understand the normal patient reactions during and after the treatment. During the treatment, the patient should not experience any sharp or burning pain, except when penetrating the skin. Why is that? Because muscle tissue is innervated by afferent C fibers, which produce a dull pain. Sharp and burning pain is mostly a sign of hitting a vessel or a nerve. So, the normal reaction of your patient during the needling is a dull and crampy pain and of course the local twitch response. A proper local twitch response. As soon as you have elicited the first local twitch response on your patient, you should tell the patient that this is what you are actually looking for. Like that, patients will usually be able to confirm local twitch responses and often even guide you to the right spots. In dry needling, it is therefore important that you always ask your patient during the treatment what type of sensation the patient experiences. Note that the patient does not necessarily feel the referred pain during dry needling, although you have elicited it in palpation first. After the treatment, patients may have post-treatment soreness of the treated muscles for a couple of days, even if the symptoms have decreased. A brief application of compression and soft tissue techniques of the treated area immediately after dry needling as well as heat, exercises and stretching can help. Small hematoma from the needle insertion are a common mild adverse event. One last comment about dry needling in general is very important for me. Although dry needling is a very effective treatment option for pain patients, and has become very popular in the past years. Please keep in mind that it should not be considered as a standalone therapy. In my experience, the best results are achieved when combining the needling with manual trigger point therapy, exercises and patient education. Congratulations, you have made it to the end of this video. Thanks and see you soon.